Hi everyone, welcome to today's lecture. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, Flannery O'Connor's short story, um, Everything That Rises Must Converge, right? Um, but before that, I'll, I have a couple of announcements to make. Um, just to remind you, the response, the first response paper is due on Sunday, right? Um, that's the 26th, 27th, the 28th, right? Uh, so try to email that to me um, by Sunday. Um, and if you're going to be a couple days late or a day late, that's fine. Just let me know, right? Um, and yeah, email that to me um, as a PDF or as a Google Doc or a Microsoft Doc um, or a Word Doc, right? Um, so whatever works for you. And there's no format requirement. I just write your name and then the uh, 250 to, to through 350 word um, response, right? Um, right, so if you have not taken a summer class before, right, you'll realize that summer classes are very fast, right? Um, and, you know, um, the, 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 the amount of reading, right, um, is sort of condensed um, throughout the week. And so, you know, work gets piled up, right? And, and I told you in my first video that I'm not sort of very strict on deadlines and stuff like that. Um, but you want to be careful um, if you're, you know, procrastinating and maybe trying to like do all the work um, on the weekend, right? Um, yeah, you want to be careful because like things can easily uh, pile up, right, for you. And when you try to sort of um, procrastinate too much, um, you know, it, it might be, it might get very difficult for you to, to recover. Um, with the work, right? So, you know, just uh, just be careful. Um, uh, maybe try to spread the work, right, throughout the week as opposed to sort of doing everything at once, um, right? And, and I guess before I start the um, talking about the story, right, um, I want to, and this is something that I do whenever I teach um, literature, right, or, you know, stories, or whenever, uh, you know, um, we, we read stories, um, that, you know, this is probably obvious, right, but stories are not real, right, um, sometimes they are based on um, real events and real experiences, um, but, you know, for, for the sake of, you know, um, this class and those of us who write about stories and who who argue um, about stories and um, and you know for the, just for the general readers right we want to sort of on the one hand understand that stories are written by people and written by um, you know written by people and they sort of and, and these writers take from their own actual experiences, right? Um, so, so yeah, so that's that's definitely there, right? The sort of like realistic part of, of, of a story. But on the other hand, right, um, stories are written by artists, right? And artists uh, use, you know, stories as a form of expression, right? And um, as a form of interpretation, uh, as a form of sort of, um, conveying uh, the world the way that they understand it as artists, right? So, so stories have a certain sort of ideology to them, right? Um, and uh, sort of stories have have an agenda, right? Um, and and so we want to sort of like understand that, right? And so with that in mind there are different ways that we can interpret stories, right? Because stories are sort of like have symbols and have patterns, right? Um, and, so, and so these symbols and patterns within the story, um, the characters, the setting, the, the sort of the narrative tone, the narrative point of view, right? So like all of these things um, that are, you know, all of this sort of like stylistic um, aspect of the stories, right? Um, 
they are they are symbols that represent something, right? Um, and so it is our job to sort of make sense of those patterns of those symbols, right? Um, and and each interpretation is is different, right? The, because our interpretation is also um, influenced by you know what how we know or what we know and um, how we've been trained to read and interpret things, right? Um, so there is no sort of like one interpretation to these stories, um, and. And yeah, so like I want you to sort of, you know, have that in mind, you know, when you're reading and when you're writing about these stories, right? That they are sort of, there's no sort of one answer to them and then well, there's no one interpretation to them, right? Um, but the strength of your interpretation depends on how you sort of, how you prove it, right? Through your argumentation, through the evidence that you sort of um, point out, um, uh, from the stories, right, and how you sort of articulate these uh, these evidences, right? How you make the assumptions, right? Um, in your in your um, essay, uh. all right. So when I was an undergrad, I I read a lot of Flannery O'Connor's um, short stories. I think she has two collections of short stories and um, two novels. Right, um, and everything that rises must converge is a short story, but it's also the title of um, her latest collection of short stories, which is everything that rises. the the The, the collection of the short stories is also called um, "Everything That Rises Must Converge." Right, um, and yeah, so I, I got into uh, Flannery O'Connor when I was in undergrad, and. Um, I was just fascinated by how sort of how funny um, she is when, when she's writing, how kind of like shady <laughs> almost. Um, she has this kind of like dark humor, uh, right? Um, and she's and the narrator, right? If you pay attention to the narrator, the narrator is almost like very kind of you know snobbish and judgmental and shady, right? Um, and so that gives it a that, that gives the story, um, you know, a, a personality, if you will, right? Um, so that's one thing that I really uh, like about her. But then also another thing that I like about her is how sort of, how violent, <laughs> I guess, like almost like every short story that she teaches or that she writes, right? Um, towards the end, and you know, um, I'm hoping that you watch this and you've already... Uh, read the story because I'm going to spoil a lot of things um, here. Um, but yeah, if, if you notice in the story, there's something very violent that happens towards the end, right? And this is not even like the most violent that's happened, right? Um, her other short stories have way more violent sort of endings, right? And and the, and the violence usually just happens in the last paragraph, sometimes the last two sentences of her short stories, right? Like everything is just kind of like, you know, bubbling and bubbling and bubbling and bubbling, and then right at the very end, something just happens, and you know, you're just like shocked that this happened, right? Um, so yeah, so so that's you know that kind of like shock factor, uh, I guess, towards the end is something that I I enjoy about her writing. Um, I don't know what that says about me, but um, yeah, and and so. That's another thing that, the, that's another reason that I like her. And, and I guess her, her sense of descriptions, right? Um, you'll notice how, how sort of, how precise her descriptions are and how sort of, how she doesn't describe sort of beauty in, in the sense that, you know, in, in a sort of um, typical sense of beauty, right? Um, you know, like Victorian poetry likes to, or romantic poetry, right, likes to describe, you know, the, the landscape and beautiful flowers and the fields of roses and, you know, stuff like that. You know, that's, that's like one way to look at beautiful description, right? Um, but Flannery O'Connor's descriptions are, are very, like they're beautiful in, in a dark way, 
right? Um, she likes to describe, you know, like the protruding teeth, right, <laughs> of, of her characters or, um, you know, something that's, that's, or, or the, or the hat, right? That's, um, that's very sort of beautiful, but also kind of like tacky looking, right? Um, so, so her descriptions are not of sort of beautiful things, but of things that are, that we don't usually sort of think of as beautiful, but then they also have their own sort of you know, beauty, because they're naturally that, you know, like a protruding teeth is not typically beautiful, but, you know, it's, people have protruding teeth, and, you know, it's, it's not their fault, and it's, it's sort of like a nature, it's a natural way of uh, becoming sometimes, and, and yeah, so maybe it is beautiful, right, um, a protruding teeth, um, but anyway, yeah, so that's another sort of aspect of, of her that I like, um, is, is her sort of, you know, um, icky, I guess, descriptions of things, right? I also want to mention, right, um, that uh, Flannery O'Connor, she was writing and she was publishing um, around uh, the 1950s, right? Um, and so what was happening uh, during that time in sort of American history, right, was, um, uh, you know, the, the effects of World War II, right, um, and also civil rights movement, right, um, and, 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 and so there, there's a lot of sort of uncertainty in America and how to sort of, um, there, it's, it's, I guess, there's a lot of uncertainty because, you know, there were, a, there were a lot of sort of like big changes that happened, that just happened, right? The Cold War was also happening during this time. And so there's a lot of going on in the world that sort of made people sort of question um, traditions, right? Um, and... And so everything was kind of in disarray, right? Um, and also, um, African Americans uh, served in um, in the military, in the U.S. military, during World War II, right? Um, and they were, you know, treated as Americans, right, during uh, during their service in the military. And so when they came came back, right, they wanted that sort of equal treatment. Um, you know, back at home in the United States, right? And so this also fueled the civil rights movement, you know, um, uh, African Americans uh, sort of um, asking for uh, equal treatment, right? Um, and so, and so, you know, like, and, and the South, you know, had, had a history of slavery, right? Um, and as, as, as mentioned here also, and so, you know, a, a lot of um, wealthy family, you know, owned slaves, you know, in the past, right? Um, and and they're experiencing this time where um, that sort of tradition, right, is being questioned, um, and there's sort of like new way of um, integrating African Americans into uh, American society, right? So there's a lot of uncertainty during this time, right? Um, and so, you know, people who thought about tradition a certain way and had very sort of like old school way of thinking were in conflict with, you know, a more sort of like progressive group of Americans, right? And so oftentimes the, those two groups, right, um, are in conflict, right? Um, and, and in the story that's sort of portrayed by the mother, right, who has very um, old school traditional Southern values, right, um, who came from um, a family of slave owning uh, sort of people, right? Um, and then Julian, the son, who is a more sort of educated, kind of um, woke, if you will, right? Um, and more sort of has a more sort of progressive uh, political and social beliefs, right? Um, and that sort of, you know, how they, and how that conflict, right, is portrayed in the story. 
um, also reflects largely sort of um, the conflict that was going on um, in America during that time. And, and, and yeah, and so that was sort of like the context, right, that, um, uh, that uh, Flannery O'Connor was writing uh, in um, and, and, and that, and she was also, um, it, you know, um, she was living in Georgia at that time um, with her mother, right? So a lot of people say that her mother, because because um, a lot of her stories has this kind of like mother figure that is kind of, you know, um, she likes to write about this kind of like hateful mother figure, right? That that's that's not only the stories. A lot of her short stories have that mother figure, right? Very old school, religious, conservative mother figure, um, and and so people wonder if you know that's you know based on her actual mother because um, Flannery O'Connor um, uh, had lupus uh, most of most of her life, right? Um, and or um, most of her adult life, right? And so she lived with her mother um, in, in Georgia uh, most of her life. Um, and and so, and yeah, so she had that very close relationship with her mother. Uh, so we'll jump right into the story, finally. Um, and I, I want to read the, the first uh, paragraph, right? Uh, the first sentence, um, you know how I you know, talk about the first sentence as always being very important. Um, I'll read the first sentence and I'll read the first paragraph, right? Uh, because there's so much going on in, in the first paragraph that sort of, um, that we, you'll, you'll realize later on that sort of like the first paragraph is actually guiding us through um, how the story is going to unfold, right? <clears throat> and it's a, it's, a, it's a sign of a great writer, right? where you can, they can sort of, you know, make or sort of, <clears throat> I guess they can um, condense, right, the, the emotion and the, the sort of, um, the, the soul, if you will, of the story within the sort of the first sentence or the first paragraph, right? Oh, and before that, I actually want to talk about the title first. So everything that rises must converge, right? Um, that could mean a lot of things to, to different people. But for me, um, let's start with the word converge, right? Converge uh, comes from the Latin root words con, which means um, together, right? And then verge or vergere. Um, which means um, to bend, right? So, so, so that the word converge means the sort of to sort of to, to bend together, right? Um, um, and so the title here is saying everything that sort of like rises, right, must converge, must sort of like bend together and maybe implode, if you will, right? Um, and yeah. I don't know. I'll just I'll just leave that there, and then have you think about what that means. Right? What, what is it about the story um, that that makes that title uh, appropriate? Right? That everything that rises must converge, bend together, and implode, right? Um, or explode? Or does it implode? Or does it explode? I don't know. Um, it's uh, I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> right. Um, and so right. So let's read the first. Uh, the first sentence and then the the first par the first paragraph so her doctor had told julian's mother that she must lose 20 pounds on account of her blood pressure so on wednesday nights julian had to take her downtown on the bus for a reducing class at the y right so so even just in the first sentence right there's a lot of it sort of like begs for context what's going on right we get introduced to a mother. We get introduced to Julian, Julian, right? Um, and then we we find out that she must lose twenty pounds because of her blood pressure. So she's 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 in ill health, right? Um, and so on Wednesday nights, Julian had to take her downtown um, on the bus, right? So, so, you know. Um, 
Julian accompanies uh, his mother, right? Uh, they take the bus to the YMCA. The Y means the YMCA, right? And the YMCA is kind of like, a, if I'm not mistaken, like a Christian kind of um, organi charitable organization, right? That sort of um, promotes um, uh, sort of, you know, healthy physical well-being, right? As, as um, uh, which is a good uh, accompaniment or companion for um, uh, a healthy, um, uh, I guess, um, sort of, I don't know, like spiritual well-being, right? That was the word that I was looking for. Um, so yeah, so something like that. But but uh, the point is that um, the YMCA, I think it's, you know, the the... Um, the, the classes, right, um, uh, are free, right? Um, and, so, and so they're taking the bus and then they're going to the YMCA, which is a charitable institution. Um, and so you get the sense that they might be broke or they're not, you know, they're, they're not very rich, right? Um, and, and, right. And so... Right. So just so just by reading the first sentence, right, you get you get this kind of like clues that you want to kind of make sense of. Right. Um, the reducing class was designed for working girls over 50 who weighed from 165 to 200 pounds. Right. His mother was one of the slimmer ones, but she said ladies did not tell her age. Ladies did not tell their age or weight. Right. So that sentence, ladies do not. She, she would not ride the buses by herself at night. Sorry. So his mother was one of the slimmer ones, but she said ladies did not tell their age or weight. Right. So, so we get a sense that the mother is kind of old-fashioned, right, um, to where, um, you know, she believes in this sort of like, you know, uh, old ideas of, I mean, it's not even old. Like some people still think this. Um, that, um, yeah, that ladies are not supposed to, you know, to say their age or their weight, right? So, so we get a sense that she's, you know, old-fashioned, right? Right, so, so she would not ride the buses by herself at night since they had been integrated. So the buses um, had been integrated, which means, um, you know, before there was a segregation, right, where African Americans um, were not allowed in the same spaces as white people, right? Schools, um, buses, you know, public spaces, right? Um, um, African Americans were segregated from those spaces, right? Um, and but then during this time, they had just been integrated, which means you know African Americans were allowed to ride in buses, right? So, so she's saying here that you know she's she's scared of being in the buses, right? Because um, she will be um, around black people, and she she will. She might be. So, so we get a sense, right, that she is a bit racist. Well, she probably is. Um, and, right, so, so that's another sort of clue, right, that we, that we get um, out of her. Um, and, then, and because the, re the reducing class was one of her few pleasures, um, right, so she would not ride the buses by herself at night since they had been integrated. And because the reducing class was one of her few pleasures necessary for health and free, right? Um, and I like how she sort of, she italicized um, the word free, right? Because she wanted to like emphasize that, you know, the mother was concerned or, you know, um, liked free things. Maybe, maybe she's not poor, but she's, maybe she's cheap, right? Um, and I'll notice like, you know, when I said that the narrator is a little bit shady, right? <laughs> like that's kind of, um, she's not just describing uh, people and uh, their experience, right? But she's she's almost giving us kind of like a judgy tone, right? She's she's judgmental about the mother, right? The 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 author or the narrator, I, I I'm saying, right? Um, she said Julian could at least put himself out to take her, uh, considering all she did for him, right? Julian did not like to consider all she did for him, but every Wednesday night, he braced himself and took her, right? And so, 
that that last sentence, right? We get a sense that Julian and her and his mother, there's a little bit of tension, right? Um, that uh, Julian doesn't like to take um, his mother um, to to the YMCA, right? But he feels pressured to do it because um, because of all she did for him, right? Which means you know she sort of you know she she mothered him, right? Um, sent him to school and all all that kind of stuff. So so he's so she's making him you know sort of feel guilty about um, feel guilty about everything that she did for him, and so now he has to sort of, you know, take care of his mother um, out of guilt, right? So, th so that sort of creates a tension between the mother um, and son uh, relationship in the story, right? Um, so yeah, so, so reading that first paragraph, right, we, if you pay attention to, you know, um, to, to, to what is being described and how it is being described, right, um, you really get a sense of, you know, um, what how the story is going to unfold, right? Um, and even just reading that first paragraph, you can then sort of identify a theme or um, uh, an, an issue, right? Um, we talked about, you know, when you're writing your paper, you want to choose an issue that you want to address, right? That you want to sort of, you want to, find a question, right, that you want to answer within your paper, right? Um, and so just with the first paragraph, right, you can sort of, you can start to identify uh, different uh, different issues, right? Religious issues, right? Um, um, issue regarding race in America during that time, right? Um, uh, the sort of mother and son dynamic and the sort of like the, the, the tension that, that, that seems to be um, um, the, 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 the tension between them, right? Um, and, and so you can kind of like think about the, the, the mother and son dynamic, right? Um, or, or, or just the characters, right? Um, how are the characters being portrayed here, right? Um, we get, maybe you're interested in the mother, right? Um, and notice too that the mother is not, there's no name for the mother, right? Um, and we get Julian's name, right, as, as, as a character. But as you read later on, the mother is just referred to as a mother. There's no name, right? So what do you think that means, right? Um, yeah, does, does that mean that perhaps she embodies a larger, uh, group of people as opposed to just a, an individual, right? Um, or, you know, it's just a coincidence. Uh, wink, wink, it's not a coincidence. <laughs> um, anyway, right, so, so if you're interested in the mother, right, um, you might want to sort of investigate, you know, why is it that she's, uh, or, you know, like, how she's being described this way, right? It's a, a kind of like, naive, old school, very traditional, um, very conservative, racist, uh, white lady, right? Um, how she's described in, in the beginning, right? And then you might want to follow her journey uh, throughout the story and see if she developed or she became even worse or, you know, whatever, right? Um, and so if you're interested in the character development or lack of development, perhaps, um, you might want to follow her, right? So, um, so yeah, so even with the first paragraph, you can already start thinking about issues that you might want to address, right? And, and once you've sort of like pointed out that issue, right, and then you want to start looking for evidence, right? Um, scenes from the story that will then reinforce that sort of claim or, or reinforce that, that, that that issue, right, is actually there. Right. All right. Um, and so, for example, right, um, that you you're interested in 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 the in the character of the mother, right? Um, and and you're interested in how she's being portrayed as cheap, right? Um, that 
I mean, you know, as, as you'll figure out throughout uh, after you read the story, right, they are actually sort of poor now or they're, they're, they're struggling, right, um, financially. Um, but, um, but it seems like even, even if they might, even though they're they're poor, right? There's this sense that the mother is just kind of like naturally cheap, right? <laughs> um, and so and so if you if you if you get that sense, right? Um, and then if you read the 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 second paragraph here, right? So the hat was new and had cost her seven dollars and a half. She kept saying, "Maybe I shouldn't have paid for it, that. Maybe I shouldn't have paid that for it. No, I shouldn't have. I'll take it off and return it tomorrow." I shouldn't have bought it, right? So, so that's that's another example, right? That will kind of like reinforce this idea that she is being cheap, right? Um, so yeah, so that's that's what you want to do um, earlier on on the on the story. You want to um, point out different issues, and then you want to start looking for proof, right? That will um, uh, defend your uh, your issue and your claim, right? And, okay, still on page one, that's paragraph one, two, three, four. Paragraph four, right. Um, and this is another example of, of her, of uh, Flannery O'Connor's uh, descriptions, right, of, you know, that, that I talked about that's kind of beautiful but also icky, right. Um, so paragraph one, two, three, four. Paragraph four. Page one, she lifted the hat one more time and set it down slowly on top of her head. Two wings of gray hair protruded on either side of her florid face, but her eyes, sky blue, were as innocent and untouched by experience as they must have been when she was ten. Right. Um, so right, the the two wings of gray hair protruded, right on either side of her florid face. So like, you can just like imagine, right? So that's you know like when you're reading something, and then you can easily imagine what that looks like when you read it. That means that that means that the description is really good, right? Uh, and to me, when I see like two wings of hair, right? So like you see like old older ladies, and they have this kind of like wings of hair on the side that's just gray, right? Um, that's what I immediately imagine, right? So so she has that sort of sign of age, right, um, on her hair, um, but that her eyes are sky blue and innocent and untouched, right, um, as if she was 10, right? Um, and so you get this juxtaposition, right, of, um, of this old lady but then she's likened to a 10-year-old child, right? Um, and as you'll realize, right, that's, that's something that will be, that will keep happening throughout the story, how she's, um, how she's described or likened to, to a child, right? Um, and how even this, you know, if you remember later on, there's a, 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 a small uh, black kid um, that sits next to her, right, and then that black kid becomes almost a mirror, right, of of the mother, right, and they're described sort of like interchangeably as um, um, as as children, right, uh, equally as children, right, um, and so that was a very interesting moment that he, you know, um, if you're interested in that, you might want to sort of think more about. Right, and then uh, in the in that same paragraph, right, um, paragraph four on page one, um, in the middle, um, we get another description. Right, so he opened the door himself and started down the walk to get her going. The sky was a dying violet, and the houses stood out darkly against it, bulbous, liver-colored monstrosities of a uniform ugliness though no two were alike. Since this had been a fashionable neighborhood for 40 years ago, his mother persisted in thinking they did well to have an apartment in it. Right. Um, and so I talked about um, Southern Gothic, right. Um, and 
you know, you can look up Southern Gothic uh, on your own. Um, and that's sort of, that's how um, um, Flannery O'Connor's uh, stories have been described, right, as sort of Southern Gothic uh, in that, you know, she, she is good at describing, um, you know, like the, the sort of like decaying, um, the, the, the decaying aspect, not only of, you know, um, of architecture or landscape, right, but also of people and people's beliefs, right? Um, there's a way in which, you know, there's, it's, it's that point where something is becoming too old and it's, it's rotting and it needs to be sort of, um, so, so that sort of like uncertainty, that angst, that sort of, that um, horrificness, the, the sort of like the disgust that, that's, that's there, right, um, is very much a part of, you know, um, uh, the, the sort of the, the style of, of uh, Southern, Goth Southern Goth Gothic, right. Um, and, and so, yeah, and so this kind of, uh, this uh, uh, description um, is, is an example of that, right? Um, and des describing this, this sort of um, house or uh, neighborhood, right, that used to be sort of the, the well-to-do or the popular, the fashionable neighborhood 40 years ago, right? But now um, is, you know, is kind of, it's, it's rotting, right? And it's old and it's, sort of that description, the bulbous, liver-colored monstrosities of uh, uniform ugliness, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a very sharp description. Um, so, so yeah, so, so, so the, these houses, right, are sort of rotting. Uh, and so as the people in it, <laughs> it seems, um, right? Um, so that's an example of the, of the Southern Gothic style, right? Um, but yeah, but but when you, if you're, for example, you're interested in Southern Gothic, right, um, and you know, and and how Southern Gothic is um, uses descriptions, right? Um, in your argument, uh, you won't just say that oh, this, uh, you know, Flannery O'Connor is uh, as a writer uh, uses the, the style of Southern Gothic, right? That's just like one aspect of your argument. You want to develop that into, so, so what? So, so what uh, if Flannery O'Connor is, is, um, is, is using uh, that style? Like, what is her purpose, right? Um, and you could argue that, you know, that that style is reflective of sort of like, you know, um, uh, an, an American sort of revolution right, um, a, a very sort of like important point in American history that sort of, that, that changed things into, you know, a different way of looking at things, a different way of looking at race, a different way of looking at people, a different way of looking at tradition, right, um, and yeah, you could argue that that's sort of like, that style reflects a turning point, right, in American history, right. So, so that would be, that would make your argument uh, sort of complex, right? And not just that, oh, you know, she's a, she's a Southern Gothic writer, right? Cool, but so what, right? <laughs> you want to give me something more than just, you know, the style, right? Um, what's at stake for the people? What's at stake, right? All right, so now I'm going to jump to talking about... Um, Julian, right, the son, because um, I think he's a very interesting character. Um, on the one hand, you you will probably find yourself agreeing with Julian, right, um, and siding with Julian and thinking, yeah, it must be really annoying to have you know that kind of mother and you know, which, who is not just overbearing as a mother but also a racist. Right, <laughs> um, and and Julian, the the sort of the the smart, educated, intellectual person that he is, right? Um, he's very aware of race issues and stuff like that, and so and so he's very, you know, he's very judgmental, right? Um, 
of, of his mother's um, very old school um, ways of thinking. Um, and so, yeah, you'll probably find yourself agreeing with Julian. But Julian is also, you know, he's not perfect. Uh, and he's, sometimes he irritates me, right? <laughs> Um, and, and he's, um, right, he's, he's, he's a complex person, right, um, and, you know, I read somewhere that, um, usually, right, in, in a, in a story, um, character development is key, right, that, that a lot of times, you know, traditionally, you get a story of a character who's, this and that, right? And then through experience, right? Uh, that character um, sort of develops, right? A and learns um, from experience and becomes, you know, wiser through experience, right? Um, that's usually sort of like the, the developmentalist uh, uh, trajectory of, of a narrative, right? Um, what is called kind of like a Bildungsroman, right? Um, where a character develops, right? Um, but what Flannery, Flannery O'Connor is doing, right, is is not really a, a develop, like, you know, when you real, realize later on, you know, the, the characters are not wiser after having experienced these things. If anything, they become stupider, or not stupider, but like, they, I don't know, maybe they realize something, but they're not, I don't think they're developed. They're either dead or, or they're, um, they sort of like, I don't know. Um, I have to think more about that. Um, but yeah, it's the, the trajectory is not necessarily of development, right? Because Julian, for example, we get like a good impression of him in the beginning, right? But then later on, we, I don't know about you, but for me, I started to dislike him. Um, and, and then I realized towards the end that he's actually very naive, right? Um, even though I, I, uh, I tend to agree with him, um, you know, I found him sort of like naive and, you know, also childish in many ways, right? Um, and so the mother too, um, we, we sort of, you know, we have, we have a different kind of trajectory, which is not development, but, um, I don't know what to call it, but I, it's not, it's not development, right? It's not a character development in that traditional sense, right? And I think that's a very interesting sort of trajectory of the characters, right? Um, that it's not a it's not a it's not a narrative of development, right? That's something that I also think about in my own research, right? Um, that I that I, I argue that um, Filipino American narratives are not narratives of development, right? But narratives of underdevelopment, um, because they sort of like they resist a, a sort of a structure of development. So the something that is in power, right, is often driven by a structure of development, right? And so those who are minoritized or marginalized or, you know, shoved on the side, you know, they're, they're almost incapable of development. And so they create a different way of, you know, developing, which is, um, which is anti-development, right, in that sense that sort of consumes and creates power, right? Um, and so I argue that underdevelopment is actually good, right? While narrative of development um, is uh, destructive and violent, right? So I'm very much interested, right, in this idea of not development, right? Um, so, and, and that's the one of the reasons why I like Flannery O'Connor is because, you know, her narratives are not one of development. It's not to sort of, you know, to put power, right, um, to the readers, right, but to, you know, because what, what, 
the narrative development does, it, it, it makes you superior as a reader, right? That, oh, I realize now. So I grow with, with the character, right? That I develop with the character. And now I become powerful, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, that's simplistic, but, you know, that's, that's sort of the sense, right? That I've, that I've accumulated this knowledge and now I can sort of rule over whatever, right? Um, and that can be dangerous in many ways, right? Um, but, yeah, for, for O'Connor, it's not necessarily um, development, right? Which is interesting to me. Um, anyway, right, <laughs> that was a long segue. Um, but, yeah, Julian, let's, let's look at page five. And this is page five towards the middle. Right. What she meant when she said she had won was that she had brought him up successfully and had sent him to college and that he had turned out so well, good looking, her teeth um, had gone unfilled so that his could be straightened, intelligent, he realized he was too intelligent to be a success, and with a future ahead of him, there was of course no future ahead of him. Right. That's a beautiful sentence, I think. Um, and, and yeah, we just get sort of like this, um, the, 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 the mother's uh, uh, point of view, right, um, towards uh, Julian, which makes, you know, which makes us sort of like question what's up with Julian, right? Um, and it actually makes you sort of kind of feel bad for the mother a little bit, right? Because, you know, like a typical mother, right? Um, she she sacrificed a lot of things uh, for um, for her son, right? Um, her teeth are protruding and sort of not straight because she would rather you know spend that money to straightening um, her son's. Um, teeth, right, um, and making sure that the son was sent to good school, had good education, and so on and so forth, right. Um, and so, right, and so, and then, in, you know, Julian is described as intelligent, but he realized that he was too intelligent to be a success, right, what does that mean, right? Um, and then with a the future ahead of him, there was, of course, no future ahead of him, right? Um, what does that mean? So, so yeah, so he's all these things, educated, intellectual, smart, woke, whatever, right? But he has a lot of limitations, right? Um, and maybe he's as naive, even more naive than his mother, right? Um, right, so... I'm going to jump right into sort of the last couple of pages, right? Um, and there's so much to talk about. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, there's not, not enough time uh, to talk about them. But I look forward to, uh, I look forward to reading your um, response papers and what you think of the story. But um, yeah, so, they they were taking the bus right, um, taking the bus to the YMCA and um, and there were some incidents in the bus right where um, Julian sort of like observed, you know, um, his mother's reaction to seeing uh, black people go in and out of the bus, right, and it, and it gave him, and this, this was sort of like the moment that um, made me kind of, you know, um, feel uncomfortable about Julian, right, because, yeah, like, he wants his mother to sort of, to realize her being racist, right, but he's also taking a lot of pleasure in in that sort of like, in that, you know, in, in, in sort of observing that, uh, that situation, right? Um, and that pleasure that he gets, right, from sort of, from, from that experience of racism is actually, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's uncomfortable, right? Uh, and it's uncomfortable because, you know, 
um, he's, I don't know, I'll have to think more about that. <laughs> um, but it, it is uncomfortable, right? Because this is, a, 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 yeah, I'll think about that. You think about that. Why is it, why do you think it's uncomfortable uh, that he takes so much pleasure in seeing this sort of, you know, um, in, in seeing this act of, of, of racism, right? Um, right, so, so yeah, so, so we're, in, we're in a bus, right? Um, and then this uh, mother and son, right? Um, and so you can kind of see the duality, right? Um, so the mother and son, Julian and his mother, right, are in the bus, and then comes in this uh, uh, African-American mother and son, right? Um, and they're, they're, they're almost like mirror, mirrors of, of um, Julian and his mother, right? Um, and I think the word mirror was sort of used in the story also. So there's something more to that um, that I don't have time to talk about, um, uh, this sort of like reflection of, you know, how sort of, um, you know, uh, the black experience is a direct reflection of the white experience, right? Because whiteness can only um, appear against blackness, right? So, so it needs something to reflect against in order for it to, to, to show, right? Um, right, so, so that's, that's an entire sort of theoretical thing that I don't have time to, to talk about, unfortunately, right? Um, uh, but the point is that, you know, um, the idea of whiteness, right, is dependent on um, subordinating blackness, right? In order for white to appear powerful, in order for white to appear um, superior, right, it has to subordinate and it has to inferiorize someone else, which is, you know, black people, right? Um, that's kind of like the short uh, story about that idea of mirroring, right? Um, that one cannot exist without the other, right? Um, so yeah, so 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 the African American family that goes into um, the the bus, right, um, is kind of a mirror of um, of Julian and his mother, but they're kind of flipped because the 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 little black boy sits next to the old white lady, right? And they are kind of like described as children together, right? Um, and there was even that moment where they were described that their feet were sort of like, they're sitting, and because the mother is also short, so their feet were kind of like dangling on, uh, on the bus chair, right? Uh, the, the, the black boy and the, and the mother, and the, the, the white lady, right? Um, their feet were kind of dangling, like very childish description of um, the feet dangling, um, right? And so, <clears throat> right, so, so that happened, right? Um, and then they, um, they got out of the bus together, right, to go to the YMCA. Um, so both, you know, the African-American mother and son and Julian and his mother, um, got out and um, and the mother was going to give the son um, a nickel right um, and it was described as as an act that was natural natural for her right which meant that you know in the past right there has been sort of like it's this kind of like natural thing that um, white people do right to to sort of to to as, as an act of um, uh, superiority towards uh, black people, especially black children, is to give them sort of a nickel, right? That's kind of like a, that's, that, that symbolizes this kind of um, hierarchical uh, thing, right? Um, um, so yeah, and so Julian said, you know, not to do it because they will get offended, right? Um, if, if she did that, 
but then she did it anyway, right? She didn't give him a nickel, she gave him a penny. <laughs> um, and then the black mother punched her <laughs> um, to the ground. I'm sorry, I'm laughing, but you know, it's, 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 it's kind of funny, right? It's like uncomfortably funny. Um, and right, so the black, uh, the black uh, mother punched her and, and then they sort of like ran, right? Um, and then Julian was kind of, you know, chuckling about it and f again, feeling way too much pleasure than um, he probably needed. Um, and and um, and right, so he he helped her, right? Um, and then she started walking back home, right? And then Julian kept convincing her um, to to take the bus, and she wouldn't take the bus. But then when Julian finally got to talk to her, she she started talking about uh, her his uh, great grandfather. Right, um, and um, and so she started to um, uh, show signs of dementia, right, um, and uh, you know, completely sort of like displaced, right, um, and and eventually fell to the ground, right, and that scene where she fell, and then her face was kind of like numb, and then one eye was kind of like empty and then the other was kind of like staring right at Julian, right? Um, that was a very chilling moment, right? I mean, and then she kind of, um, I think, I don't know if it was described that she died, but I think, yeah, I think she kind of like dropped dead um, after a couple of minutes, um, right? And then, and then Julian starts running, right? Running to get help and and then that last sentence also, right, uh, it's very chilling. So the tide of darkness seemed to sweep him back to her, postponing from a moment, postponing from moment to moment his entry into the world of guilt and sorrow, right? Um, and so everything that he did, very judgmental, hated his mother, right, hated everything about her. Um, now that she's dead on the ground, right? That moment, uh, as Flannery O'Connor describes it, is a moment that will lead him to eternal guilt and sorrow, right? So, so no matter how it seems, right? No matter how hate, like how much she hate, how much he hated his mother, and that that death, right? That potentially because, oh, right, because of that pleasure, right, that he felt, perhaps, that that pleasure, right, led to that guilt um, later on, right. Um, oh, that's interesting, okay. Um, so yeah, so despite how, how much he hated his mother, that death, which potentially, perhaps, he caused, I mean, not really, I mean, the woman was sick and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't his fault that she got punched, um, whatever. Like, a lot of things, right, kind of uh, came together, right? Everything, like, ev a lot of things rose, right, before it converged, <laughs> right? Um, so a lot of things happened, right, that leading to her death, right? So it's hard to say, you know, what caused her death, right? But then it seems to, for Julian, right, that he might blame himself that... He sort of, he did not sort of enter, or I don't know, that perhaps he could have done more, or whatever, so that she didn't die, right? Whatever, for whatever reason, right, she, he will sort of feel this eternal guilt and sorrow um, because of that. So, so yeah, so, like, there's no, <laughs> there's no resolution, there's no, um, there's no happy ending, obviously, there's no like what we're given are just a bunch of questions and a bunch of ways to speculate, right? What's going to happen and what happened, right? And so there's no development. There's no, 
I don't feel good about it, so you probably don't feel good about it, and I think that's the point um, of, of the story. Um, but yeah, um, I hope you enjoy the story as much as I did, right? Um, because I like sick, tragic, comic uh, stories like this. Um, and yeah, let me know what you think. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to hear your thoughts um, in your reading response. So, all right, until then, bye.